Welcome to the inaugural Ireland Canada Business Council event. The ICBC is a newly incorporated entity, formerly known to many of you as the Pan Can Committee, and is made up of representatives from the chambers in Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, and the Ireland Alberta Canada Trade Association. I'm Jackie Gilner, and today our speakers will address CETA resources, tools, opportunities, and lessons learned from an operational perspective. The goal of today's session is to help you and your business understand the challenges and actions required to prepare for a smooth entry into each country. We begin with a word of welcome from the Irish Ambassador to Canada, Ambassador-designate to Jamaica and the Bahamas, Dr. Eamon McKee, who comes to us from Ireland today. The Eva Cordia, I'd like to say Goramil Amalga, the great thank you to Jackie Gilner for organizing this virtual event. Um, the work of the Irish Chamber of Commerce in Ottawa and the Canada Ireland Business Council is, is terrific, uh, particularly in this event, which combines two things which are, I think, essential to business. One is networking, uh, the creation of, of contacts and relationships uh, with people that you want to do business with. And the second thing is the fine details um, where you search for business opportunities. And those business opportunities have really increased with CETA. It's a tremendous opportunity for Ireland and for Canada to develop business relationships because of the way that it aligns standards um, and uh, codes, uh, reduces barriers to trade uh, and helps boost services. We've already seen the impact of that because as you know, trade uh, agreements smooth out uh, some differences even before they're ratified. And so the boost in Can Canadian Irish trade is, 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 is obvious to see. Um, I also think, looking at it more broadly, that Ireland and Canadian relationships are set to take off. Uh, there's a real new sense of energy in the relationship, a sense of comfort. It's been boosted, of course, by new Irish immigrants that came in the wake of the global financial crisis um, and have settled here in Canada, made it their home, uh, because Canada allows for uh, the full deployment of, of talent and potential. And we see that in the membership of, of the Chambers of Commerce right across Canada. It's also a very welcome development to see the PAN Chamber develop. And um, the Embassy is really interested in working with you and developing this as a, as a way of moving forward. So listen, I want to wish you a, a great event. I hope you make loads of contacts. I know there's an element of speed dating and it's virtual, but I'm sure something productive will come out of this, indeed many things. So very best of luck. Gormiel Malgoth again and uh, hope to meet you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And now to the Canadian Ambassador to Ireland, Her Excellency Nancy Smythe. Ambassador, we're absolutely thrilled to have you join us today and certainly for our Canadian audience to hear from Team Canada over in Dublin. Ambassador Smythe, over to you. Thank you, Jackie, and the entire Ireland Canada Chamber team for organizing this wonderful event. I'm happy to be speaking to you today from our Canadian Embassy in beautiful Dublin. I know we're currently in unprecedented times. We continue to be in unprecedented times as we uh, come through this global pandemic, but also as we work together, uh, united more than ever, working to protect the rule of law, defend human rights in light of the atrocities we're seeing in Ukraine and the unprovoked illegal invasion of Ukraine. Our thoughts are with the entire Ukrainian community and Canada stands in fierce support of Ukraine along with our European neighbours and of course um, uh, Ireland uh, as, as an important part of that. Today's event is especially timely as we are approaching the fifth anniversary of the provisional application of the Canadian uh, of the Canada-EU Comprehensive and Economic Trade Agreement or CETA. You know that Canada and Ireland share a close relationship built on shared values, common priorities, it's the foundation really for our friendship and for our relationship. And we see incredible potential for expanding business opportunities on both sides of the Atlantic. Both of our countries are open trading economies and trade is a really important part of our bilateral relationship. CETA has further strengthened this relationship, not only by addressing and removing barriers um, to trade such as tariffs uh, for, first and foremost, but also by really providing that robust uh, rules-based framework for engagement on, and dialogue on issues that uh, we both care deeply about, including climate, sustainable development, and making sure that uh, trade uh, is inclusive. So CETA is the most ambitious and progressive trade agreement that Canada and the EU have ever implemented to date. 
Under CETA, we see 98% of goods allowed to enter uh, into both of our countries uh, duty-free, but also a facilitation of labour mobility between Canada and the EU, and a comprehensive chapter on government procurement, which is unprecedented. So I'm sure you can imagine how attractive that all makes the EU and Ireland as a destination for Canadian business. And since CETA came into effect in 2017, our merchandise trade has increased by nearly 40% services trade, uh, sorry, 45% uh, services trade by, by nearly 40%. And I was happy to see that even in 2021, um, those numbers of merchandise exports for Canada into Ireland rose uh, by 15%, even during a very difficult year. The two-way uh, investment has also grown considerably, and this has led to now 75 countries, uh, 75 com companies that are Canadian operating here in Ireland, uh, and with them the creation of some 15,000 jobs. CETA really is a world-class agreement that advances higher standards for living uh, of living for everyone. It fosters sustainable and inclusive economic growth. It strengthens labour rights and commits to high levels of environmental protection. And it really expands those opportunities for consultation uh, with all segments of society in, in, in both of our countries. Uh, it's clear that CETA is providing great benefits to Canada and to Canadian businesses. And I hope that this event will prove to be informative to you in terms of demonstrating how both Canada and Ireland can really maximize and take full, um, derive full advantage from the free trade agreement. And so the Canadian Embassy uh, is here to meet with you and to support you. And we're looking forward to hearing uh, the comments today from the speakers. We're looking to connect with you uh, at any opportunity that you think will help you in your journey. You'll be hearing from Mina Buller, who's a, a colleague here with the Trade Commissioner's team, Trade Commissioner Service team, about how we support Canadian businesses in Ireland and really how to maximize those benefits of CETA. So we really wish you a successful event. Thank you again to Jackie for your invitation and I'll turn it back over to you. Ambassador Smythe, thank you very much. We will now continue with your colleague, uh, Vice Council and Trade Commissioner Mina Buller, who will speak to the Canadian perspective. Mina, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Jackie, and to the entire Ireland Canada Business Council team for organizing this wonderful event today. I'm so happy to be speaking to you from our Canadian Embassy here in Dublin, Ireland, where I work as part of the Trade Commissioner Service team in our commercial section. Today, I'll be outlining some of the real and practical benefits of the trade agreement between Canada, the EU, CETA, for Canadian companies seeking opportunities in Ireland and across Europe as well as some tools and services that we offer to Canadian businesses through the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service. CETA has been benefiting Canadian and Irish companies since its provisional application in 2017. With 98% of EU tariff lines now being duty-free for Canadian goods, there's a big advantage for Canadian companies seeking opportunities in the EU. Ireland is a great choice for Canadian companies looking to expand internationally, not only due to the benefits brought on due to CETA, but with its attractive uh, tax rate. Also, the fact that Ireland is the last remaining country in the EU that still speaks English, and the fact that it's considered the ideal gateway into the rest of the EU market. As you heard from Ambassador Smythe earlier today, CETA really is the global gold standard trade agreement with its comprehensive chapters that access, that address and remove trade barriers, but also the chapters that provide for a more sustainable and inclusive trade environment for everyone, especially for small and medium-sized businesses. CETA has many practical aspects that will benefit Canadian companies. For example, CETA increases competitiveness. With lower or no tariffs, it costs less to take your Canadian goods or services to the EU. Once CETA is fully implemented, almost 99% of EU tariff lines will be duty-free. CETA reduces red tape. Procedures for the release of goods have been simplified. Goods can now be released at the first point of arrival and documentation requirements for certain goods have been streamlined. Canada and the EU are working to keep customs procedures simple, effective, clear and predictable to reduce those processing times at the border and to make movements of goods cheaper, faster and more efficient. The agreement also addresses potential barriers to digital trade and protects the free flow of data across borders. CETA gives increased access. 
Canadian businesses now have access to European government procurement contracts at all levels, creating new opportunities at the member state, regional and local government levels. This is now worth an estimated $3.3 trillion annually. CETA improves access for services companies. With a few exceptions, your services company will be treated the same way as one from the EU. There's also predictability and transparency in several service sectors, such as architecture, engineering, and R&D. CETA increases labor mobility. It makes it easier and more predictable for Canadian skilled professionals to work temporarily in and to stay for longer in the EU. Here at the Trade Commissioner Service, we're very pleased to offer support to Canadian companies by linking you in with our network of regional offices across Canada who are well placed to help you prepare for your first foray into international markets. Once you've determined your target export market, whether it be Ireland or elsewhere, uh, our network of trade commissioners around the world are here to offer you on the ground intelligence, access to our network of local qualified contacts, partnership opportunities, and practical advice to help you make better, more timely, and more cost-effective decisions to help you achieve your international business goals abroad. The Trade Commissioner Service is also home to the Can Export Fund for SMEs, where we match up to $50,000 to help you access brand new markets for your company. We can also help you with trade missions and sector specific events, and help you learn how to export your goods or services while fully utilizing CEDA's benefits. Specifically here in Ireland, we do see a number of opportunities for Canadian companies, ranging from clean tech to ICT to life sciences. And so please do reach out to us because we're looking forward to working with you to help you explore this international expansion opportunity. Thank you so much again, Jackie, and to the entire organizing committee. Really happy to be a part of this event. Now back to you. Thank you, Mina. That was very informative. Alongside the team at the Embassy, the Ireland Canada Business Association are a terrific resource for Canadian companies operating in Ireland. We look forward to speaking with the ICPA in a forthcoming future event. We now turn to Enterprise Ireland. Enterprise Ireland is the Irish government's agency responsible for the development and growth of Irish companies in global markets. They invest in the most innovative Irish companies through all stages of their growth and connect them to international customers across multiple industries. Enterprise Ireland's goal is to build successful, long-term business relationships between international companies and Irish partners. With over 40 offices worldwide, Enterprise Ireland has uh, two offices in Canada, there's one in Toronto and most recently in Montreal. Enterprise Ireland's team of industry experts consult with international businesses to understand and solve their business needs and support Irish companies to start, innovate and scale in Canada. Lydia Rogers is the country manager for Enterprise Ireland in Canada. She relocated from EI's headquarters in Dublin to Toronto in 2021, and I believe has just endured her first full winter here. Lydia, great to see you again. Uh, question, can you outline for us how CETA has helped Enterprise Ireland's clients setting up here in Canada and speak to some of the challenges or smoother sailing experience because of CETA? And before you leave us, if you have any tips to share on how to best leverage CETA, our listeners are all ears. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, lovely to be here and thank you for the opportunity. It's uh, great to be able to talk about the opportunities in Canada and really the benefits that CETA does bring to Irish companies that want to export into the market. So as Jackie said, my name is Lydia Rogers. I am the country manager for Enterprise Ireland here in Canada. We have an office in Toronto for many years and uh, recently established a presence in Montreal. And for those attendees that may be not that familiar with Enterprise Ireland, we are the trade and innovation agency of the Irish government and really here our remit and our mandate is to support Irish companies that want to start innovate scale and grow within the Canadian market and we very much see Canada as a key growth market our clients increased their exports in from 2019 to 2020 despite the pandemic and all of the challenges it brought and I think that's a real testament to the ease of doing business um, in Canada 
So we work with a lot of clients um, across a very diverse portfolio and, and diverse sectors, everything from fintech and financial services to education, digital technologies, life sciences, industrial technologies, consumer retail, um, and many, many more subsectors. But what I would say is that we have really identified um, and Canada has been a really great partner and a positive country for um, export partners. And I think that's down to Canada's leaders really working hard to make the country a very favourable environment, resulting in the development of the, the CETA Free Trade Agreement and one of the most comprehensive uh, tariff reduction packages ever achieved in the EU FTA. Um, which means now that Irish producers, our manufacturers and exporters really do have unprecedented access to the Canadian market. Um, and I think really an important point is that, you know, the benefits and opportunities to businesses in this agreement are, I think, particularly valuable for small and medium sized enterprises that given, you know, trade barriers tend to disproportionately um, you know, burden smaller firms who may have fewer resources. Um, so really valuable for SMEs. And Jackie, if I may, I might just give you a run through of you know, some of the direct um, feedback we're hearing from clients in terms of the benefits of CETA. And I suppose one of those, and, and the one probably most people think about automatically, is tariff reduction and you know the fact that 99.6% of all industrial tariffs have effectively been eliminated. But when you think of that in, in a business and a commercial context, it's really, really significant. So pre the provisional application of CETA in 2017, if you take the likes of you know medical devices or instruments, you know, it, there was up to 8% of a tariff. If you take the likes of um, machinery or electrical equipment, it was up to 9.5%. If you take textiles or clothing, it was up to 16%. They are all zero now, so very, very significant. Um, and I know some of our clients have spoken publicly in terms of the benefits that brings for them, the likes of Hannah's Hats, Ireland's Eye Knitwear, Modern Botany Beauty and Skincare. And all of these products carry 0% duties now. And the feedback that we're getting from clients is, you know, multitude um, in terms of, you know, it's been a major deciding factor in choosing to really explore the Canadian market and market entry. Um, it's supporting market diversification, particularly as a result potentially of Brexit. It's providing price certainty. It's helping clients to grow sales in the, in the market now that the product is less expensive. It's also removed the hassle of having to pay duties at the point of entry, really making the process much more efficient and also uh, ultimately helping with cash flow, which is a really big benefit. But I think overall, in terms of the tariff piece, it's just making SMEs much more competitive and being able to compete for opportunities in the market. And I think then some of the other probably less talked about, um, but at the same time, very tangible benefits for our clients is you know, opening up of the services market, making it easier for Irish professionals to work in Canada, doing intra-company transfers, framework to, you know, recognise qualifications in, you know, certain regulated professions, um, much more compatible technical requirements. So for engineering companies and machinery um, product standards and certification. And then a very significant uh, access to Canada's large procurement market. And I think this is probably one of the big gains um, in terms of CETA in that Canada has opened up the government tenders to EU countries um, more so um, than any other of its trading partners and not just at federal level but provincial and municipal as well which is so significant. Um, and if you take it, you know, Canada's provincial uh, procurement market is estimated to be double the size of the federal equivalent, which is about 22 billion annually. Um, it is quite significant. Um, I would also say, you know, just in terms of, of the benefits, we're seeing growth in terms of Irish enterprises exporting um, into Canada. And in the past few years, Irish innovation has, you know, really played a significant role in Canada's economy. And just to give you a few examples um, of those clients benefiting, um, you know, we have a medical device company, Aerogen, who has been supporting emergency departments and ICUs, um, you know, caring for patients with COVID-19. We've had Irish technology clearing winter snow and plenty of it. 
and in fact the city of Laval in Quebec is now the largest owner and operator of multi-hog multi-purpose vehicles so Irish company multi-hog um, X-Ocean has been remotely serving the seabed of Lake Superior Swoop Funding is helping Canadian small and medium-sized enterprises access funding. And I know you'll hear from Dara a little later on about kind of the practicalities of doing business in Canada. But we then also have clients revolutionizing how the agriculture industry maximizes efficiency and sustainability. And some examples are Keenan and Samco. We have a tech client, WorkVivo, who is really powering a much more connected employee experience and workplace. And I think everybody agrees so much more important now um, as we've navigated a totally different working environment with remote and hybrid and blended working following the pandemic. And, you know, Keyword Studios, a key client of ours delivering creative services to the video gaming industry based out of Montreal. So you can see the really strong examples of Irish companies growing in Canada and our vision is to see that continued growth and we do see a lot of opportunities um, in Canada and ultimately see that as being a real benefit in making it much easier to do business for manufacturing and services enterprises and helping them capitalize on opportunities. So I would just finally say, you know, there's a lot of information out there and sometimes that in itself can be challenging around CETA. So, you know, come to us. We have five uh, market advisors here in the market um, and really to support enterprises that want to start and scale in Canada. And we're here to provide practical support in terms of the export journey. Uh, so do look us up on um, LinkedIn. We have an EI Canada page. Um, and Jackie, I'm conscious I'm gone slightly over time, so I'll hand it straight back to you. Gosh, Lydia, what a success story. Uh, so many Irish companies in Canada spread over diverse sectors. And uh, congratulations to yourself and the team for opening the new offices in Montreal. In a recent interview with the Montreal Gazette, Paul Dunn, President of the Ireland Canada Chamber in Montreal and Director and Treasury here at ICBC, said that working together will continue to strengthen Irish-Canadian business partnerships in the future. And speaking to Paul's point, we see that same drive from all Canadian and Irish organisations engaged in helping strengthen the economic ties between our two countries. The recent visit to Ireland by the Ireland Alberta Trade Association and the growing membership of the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce in Vancouver are all strong indicators of an increasing demand for access to Irish and Canadian markets. Equally, the Canadian Embassy in Ireland and the Ireland Canada Business Association in Dublin are increasingly busy as demand grows. It's now time to chime into a discussion between Keith Ward, Director of Communications at ICOT, and Erin Kelly, CEO and co-founder of Advanced Symbolics. Erin and Keith, over to you. Erin, you're very good to give us your time. Um, I, I wanted to start off by asking you what your experiences are about kind of from a pros and cons perspective of, of reaching in and, and working in new markets from outside of Canada and, and in this case, uh, Ireland. Well, that's a, it's, I mean, obviously the biggest con has been the pandemic and not being able to figure out when you can come and whether or not if you go there, businesses are open. So I've been writing to people say, are people back in the office? I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge. I mean, I'm not going to fly to, I mean, I, I suppose I can, I can fly to Dublin and then we meet in a cafe or something, but it, it's always a little bit better if you're meeting in a boardroom where you can have a screen and, and, I prefer the face-to-face, -face, especially after two years of not having that. Yes, we can do the Zoom thing. And in some cases, that's convenient, right? I mean, you you can knock off a number of Zoom meetings a day, but it just, uh, it's still figuring it out, I guess. So I'm, I'm going to Europe in June, going to Amsterdam in France. I think, you know, so things seem to have opened up quite a bit. The things are opening up in Europe. I've been going to the U.S. for conferences for a while. Um, yeah. But I think Europe has maybe been a bit slower to open up. Yeah, I agree. It, it, sometimes this online world isn't conducive, I feel, to uh, collaboration uh, in, in, in that respect, since I suppose restrictions involved. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, Advanced symb uh, Symbolics uh, does? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, um, we're an artificial intelligence company, and our AI is able to properly sample demographics on social media for the purposes of market research. And so what do I mean by properly sample? The AI can automatically determine 
demographics, like age, gender, you know, ethnicity and all of those things so that we can make sure that the people that we are observing match the distribution of the population as a whole. So in Ireland, you know, you've got the census. So it looks at the census data and says, okay, our sample of people that we're observing has to look like the Irish census. And based on that, because it, it matches that, we can say the accuracy of what we're finding online is, is very high. And so we're, and, and that's the same kind of methodology that phone surveys use or, you know, web, web panels don't use that because they can't determine with accurate, with high accuracy, the demographics of the population they're observing, or that they're asking questions of. We don't ask any questions. It's a passive data, um, you know, scraping, if you will. Yeah. Um, but, but we are able to get all of that. So we can, we can tell you what men of a certain age and income think, what women of that demographic think, what people in Dublin think versus what people in Cork think. So, so that's basically what we do. Yeah, and I mean, if you were to start it all over again from from kind of using what you know now about getting into new markets, and as I said, in particular, even Ireland, is there something that you wish you knew now that that, that would have maybe given you an advantage going in? Or maybe even advice for someone else thinking of doing something similar, not necessarily from an AI perspective, but, but, but a business perspective? Yeah, I think a lot of mentorship. I think you need a, I think you need, um, you need to talk to people both who are in Ireland, and I've kind of done that, but also Canadian companies that have moved into Ireland, which is a much smaller cohort. But I think there's so many um, things that you need to consider when you're moving into a new country that um, I think mentorship or having peers who have done something like that is really important. So it's, it's very much getting someone who kind of uh, maybe has a like a, a pre a pre knowledge of of not only the market but I suppose how things work to so, something that maybe isn't as tangible. Yeah, and for for me, like I have family in Ireland, and they have you know very strong opinions about how we should be doing things. But it it might be different for I mean every situation is different. Like I'll give you an example for us. So we so we were scoping out Ireland before the pandemic, and then now I have to start that exercise all over again. I don't know how Ireland has changed. I'm sure it mm. has to some degree. But my challenge before the pandemic was we scoped out um, Dublin, and then but we really wanted to be in Cork, and here's why: we have a lot of relationships with the University of Cork, like not to do with my family, just business wise. And from a talent from a talent acquisition point of view, Ireland is challenging for us. I know that it's a well-educated population, which is great, but it is a small population and you've been attracting of tech talent. So I'm going to be going in there and competing with Google and Yahoo and all this, and they all, they are all in Dublin. So um, do I want to be in there trying to compete with all of those guys? Maybe we try to be a little bit more attractive. I don't know if it's more attractive or not being in Cork. I'm hear, hearing a lot of different opinions about that, but it, you know, so, so there's that aspect. The, the problem with being in Cork is the airport is not as good, right? <laughs> and so the last time I was there, I said, okay, I'm going to pretend I live in Cork. I stayed there and I tried to travel around Europe from Cork. And that was a not as pleasant an experience, to put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. And so, and, and then people are saying, well, you could just drive to Dublin. Well, no, not really. Like I'm, I'm expecting my staff are going to be traveling a lot. So I can't expect them to be driving to Dublin so they can go to Paris. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Very true. And isn't it funny because I would always I would always think of Ireland or, or Dublin more so being the hub of the, this tech hole, but also what that leads to is intense probably competition, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's intense competition. It's also very expensive. So for our staff, do they want to live in a, in such an expensive city and it's I'm hearing it's congested and there's lots of traffic and all that versus say Cork, which is less congested. I don't know that it's less expensive. I think it is. Um, and, you know, it's got it's got some some pluses and that that's the thing. And that's where I think I need um, that, you know, that where that mentorship comes in, because we have like, you know, in where we are in Canada, we're in Ottawa. We're not in Toronto. And being in Ottawa has a lot of advantages for our staff. It's a it's got a much more um, variety in Ottawa. There's a lot more nature. You can live on a lake here. You can have all these things, but it's still the capital city of Canada. So, you know, you're not in the sticks. So, yeah. you know, it's it's but it's 
uh, much more, I would say, kind of family friendly environment. And, and we find that a lot of our best staff are in that kind of 30s range where they are thinking of having family. Like we're not so much we're not hung up like a lot of tech companies are in hiring like 22 year olds. Like we we have staff that are the whole spectrum. And um, and for them, I think being in a place where you can own a bigger property with some land, not be stuck in traffic all the time, there's there's some tangible uh, benefits. So I I think if I were say the Irish government, I know the Irish government's been trying to encourage people to to go out west and stuff like that. The problem is access to transit and, and flights because Ireland is an island. We're going there because we want access to the mainland. And it is something that I've heard from people that they're starting to think more of the Netherlands and things like that because it is on the continent and has better access to the continent. So I think that's a challenge for Ireland If I that you need to be more than Dublin. And in order to be more than Dublin, you need to have access. I know it's a bit of chicken and egg because you need to have the people there before you can have the flights. But it's a, you know, it's a challenge, I think. Yeah, it's a very good point. It's all well and good inviting these uh, these companies over to invest, but the infrastructure isn't there to uh, to to support that kind of growth. Then it could be certainly problematic. Erin, uh, I, I really appreciate the time. I know you're extremely busy. You just got off a flight this morning, so I really do appreciate it. Erin uh, Kelly from Advance uh, Symbolics, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Erin. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly, your experience has been. Um, interesting to hear and also to hear how you've built relationships with the universities down in Cork, perhaps uh, Aer Lingus uh, will consider or other airlines consider making the connections better, but uh, please do consider us into the future, don't rule us out yet. Uh, as we know, each experience is different and we'll now hear from Dale Burke, head of Swoop Canada. I spoke with Dare as Swoop touched down in Canada where the Ireland Canada Chamber in Toronto, along with Enterprise Ireland, was ready to help promote the company's activities. Now well on the road to being established in the marketplace, we will hear about their journey and tips. Hello, my name is Dara Burke. I'm head of Swoop here in Canada. I'd like to thank the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce and the Ireland Canada Business Council for inviting Swoop to participate in this event and share our experiences um, from launching Swoop in Canada. It's been a fantastic experience for our team and we've been really encouraged by the reaction our solution has received among small businesses. During the presentation, I'll introduce the Swoop platform and provide some background to our journey to date as a business. I'll walk through some of the factors which were important to us in our decision to launch Swoop in Canada. I'll also take you through a high level summary of our Canada launch project and finish with some of our observations and lessons learned. The mission of Swoop is to create a solution that makes it easy for businesses to source and save money they need to grow. Both of Swoop's founders spent many years helping SMEs raise finance throughout their journey, so they knew what was needed was some solution to simplify and speed up the process that businesses have to go through to secure grants, loans, and equity investments, as well as finding savings for their business. SMEs are not smaller version of larger businesses, and they don't have the in-house finance expertise or the additional time that sometimes is required to navigate the financing landscape and understand the products that are available. As a result, many small business owners don't bother trying, and it's not down to a lack of choice as there are a wide range of products available to them on the market. And that's why we founded Swoop an online marketplace for small and medium-sized businesses that brings together all types of funding from across the market. Business owners can plug in their data sources and use that to power our matching engine, which brings together options from grants, loans, equity, and savings products as well for their business. I've summarized some highlights from the past couple of years since launching Swoop. We now have a user base of over 70,000 businesses. We've helped those businesses secure over $350 million in funding. We've been successful in our regulatory applications to the FCA in the UK, to ASIC in Australia, and we also have a pending application with the Central Bank of Ireland. We've expanded into a number of new markets, including the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and now Canada. We've been fortunate to be recognized within open banking and ESG with a number of awards, and our, in, our platform has been designed to allow small business owners to integrate their data sources, such as their banking data, their accounting data, 
and also their e-commerce data. So I'm just going to talk through some of the important factors that drew us to Canada as a market. Um, I think firstly, the 1.2 million SMEs was a significant addressable market for our product. When we were conducting a feasibility analysis of the market at the start of the project, um, our analysis indicated that the vast majority of these companies were going underserved by the traditional financial institutions in Canada, and that it was quite a fragmented market. There appeared to be a gap for an online marketplace offering um, that could bring together many sources of funding from across the market and, and, and really tailored towards small businesses. Canada has an impressively diverse and comprehensive range of government funding programs. However, these can be complex and time consuming to navigate for a small business owner. Open banking has been a major component in Swoop's early success in the UK. Open banking has the potential to deliver real value and choice to small businesses. And our solution is designed to enable the small business owner to use their financial data to maximize the value that's, that open banking has to offer. Knowing that open banking is coming down the tracks in Canada, this was also an important uh, consideration for us. Um, to talk about Toronto, I suppose, as a city, uh, it being the second biggest financial services hub in North America was a significant draw for our company due to the concentration of financial institution and lending partners of ours that were in the city, but also the wider ecosystem that has developed over time, uh, which has resulted in there being a, a, a talent pool uh, that was attractive for us in this area. The fintech and digital financing sector in Canada is growing really, really fast. There are ecosystems forming around this area in the greater Toronto area, but also Montreal uh, in particular. And, and, and those, those regions are gaining global notoriety. We want to provide small businesses with the most amount of choice possible. So the prominence of neo banks and digital lenders are an important indicator, which we pay attention to. The fact that Canada is largely an English speaking uh, and pro business common law jurisdiction was also an important consideration from us because we felt that this would reduce the complexity around setting up uh, and becoming operational. And I think finally, knowing that we are a global marketplace, we did have some existing strategic and funding partners that were present both in Canada and other markets that we operate in, which, which again reduced the level of complexity um, related to launching. We successfully launched Swoop in Canada in November 2021. I've pulled together a high level timeline of the project milestones, which paved the way for that launch. In July 2020, we started with a feasibility analysis of the Canadian market, and that helped us to understand the composition of the market from a small business perspective, and also get an understanding of who the key players were in the market, both from a competitor perspective, but also from a lending perspective. That analysis paved, that analysis was the key input for our go to market strategy, which we subsequently developed. In, in February 2021, we started to get into the more technical aspects of the planning, and that include, included identifying data centers that we could host our platform in, but also it, it, it included a regulatory assessment of our operating model. Given that we're operating in a highly regulated sector, it's important for us to understand who the regulators are, both at a provincial level and at a federal level, uh, and also whether or not we would need to submit any applications to those regulators in order to conduct our business. In addition to this, we had to write internal policy documents to make sure that we were compliant with any data uh, or privacy legislation that existed in Canada. In May 2021, we started the process of designing the minimal viable product for our launch. It was important for us to get a robust and attractive uh, offering out into the marketplace for our launch, but we also wanted to make sure that we had it scaled back to a point that was easy for us to deliver and build on. We started the building and the testing of this product in the summertime in July 2021, and we started to develop a marketing strategy for the launch in, in August time. So that was really our planning around how we were going to attract and acquire the initial users of the platform. In September 2021, we conducted a soft launch of the product. Uh, this allowed us a period of time before the hard launch where the platform was live and there were some users coming through and registering with Swoop um, and allowed us to adjust and tweak things as, as required. 
Um, during this period of time, we also started to recruit a small team in Toronto. In November 2021, with the help of Enterprise Ireland and some of our other partners, we um, successfully launched the product. Finally, I'm going to share some lessons learned and observations that we had during the project. I'll start with market analysis. We drew on a lot of different data sources when we were conducting our feasibility study. These included some government resources, specifically from Statistics and Statistics Canada and the CRA, which, which we drew heavily on. However, we did find one, one gap that was of note. We found that there was no centralized database for company registration data. Although at a federal level, there is an open source database that I think is now accessible via API, the same is not true for the rest of the provinces across Canada, which actually accounts for the vast, vast majority of company registrations. The obvious point of comparison for us would have been the CRO in Ireland and Companies House in the UK, both of which we've been able to build direct integrations into and, and greatly enhances our product. Um, we did explore this in, in Canada in, in, in the private sector through integrations with companies like Trulio, Kicker, CreditSafe, However, the cost and reliability we felt weren't uh, a fit for what we needed. I think this is an area that, that Canada can, can, could do well by improving um, as not only does it increase visibility and ease of conducting due diligence and KYC, it also creates a better data profile for businesses that are out there and allows fintechs and innovators to create products and services that will help those businesses. The next point that I'll deal with is the entity setup. This was overall quite a positive experience for us. Um, having launched in Australia earlier in 2021, where we actually had quite a cumbersome and complicated project uh, process around setting up an entity, we found that setting up an entity and incorporating Canada was quite straightforward. The only um, complexity we had to navigate was around which province do we uh, incorporate in or, or do we do so federally? And in April 2021, which is when we incorporated, there were a number of provinces in which we couldn't incorporate because we didn't have a resident director on the ground. Uh, therefore, we selected British Columbia. Uh, I believe Ontario has recently removed the requirement to have a resident director, but that did inform our decision to register in British Columbia. The next point is around the CRA and, and tax registrations. This was something that we um, encountered a bit of friction and a bit of complexity around. As, as newcomers to Canada uh, and, and as personally a newcomer to Canada, uh, I personally didn't have tax records with the CRA and this prevented me from setting up a CRA account online for the business um, as I personally was a director. Um, I did contact the CRA a number of times and unfortunately I did receive conflicting advice depending on the agent I was speaking to. We ended up outsourcing our payroll function to ensure that we were being compliant uh, with the relevant payroll requirements and the feedback we got from the payroll provider was that it's not uncommon for um, individuals and companies to get conflicting advice from the CRA when we contact them. So that was something that we um, felt is worth calling out for anybody setting up in Canada. The next point was around partner engagement. So partnerships are at the core of everything that we do as a marketplace and it allows us to bring products and services to our users across lending, grants, um, equity investments and savings. This was an area we had um, a very positive experience in. We found that almost all of the financial institutions um, strategic partners, chambers of commerce, were all highly engaging and, and, and willing to cooperate and work with us. Um, I think from a cultural perspective, we found that people were consistently very genuine and, and helpful when we, when we engaged with them. And perhaps that's a, a trait that's evident across Canada. I think for us, we, we obviously work with, with banks and the, the big six or the big five banks in Canada uh, are, or at least we found them to be quite slow um, in terms of progressing with partnerships, but that was consistent with what we experienced with, with the larger financial institutions in Australia and, and the UK as well. So uh, perhaps not a, a Canada specific piece of feedback. The next piece that I wanted to talk about was business insurance. 
And, and I, I'll call this out specifically because we as a, as a fintech actually encounter quite a bit of difficulty uh, in securing cover for the business. So the type of cover that we would normally um, be required to get would be professional indemnity or errors and admissions and cyber insurance. Um, and if I was to compare the, the market here to Australia, Ireland and the UK where, where we have cover, uh, it, it was more challenging to get an insurer to, to cover the business. The next point was around recruitment. Um, and I know that it's a very, very hot topic at the moment. And uh, there's certainly a perceived talent scarcity a, a, across a number of different areas of the economy. Um, but we did have quite a positive experience. Um, we made use of certain platforms to advertise roles and attract candidates that included LinkedIn, Angels List, and Indeed. But actually we found recruitment, recruitment in network through partners and referrals to be more successful. Um, we also are starting to partner with some local universities, including Ryerson, and we're hoping to start our first co-op program in, in May 2022. Finally, the regulatory landscape assessment, which, as I mentioned previously, is very, very important for our business as a financial services business, was um, challenging. Given that it is a, a, a complex area, we did have to go out, uh, go to a law firm uh, that specializes in this area to get some advice on our business model um, and get clarity about whether or not our business model would, would need to be regulated by a particular regulator in Canada. There are um, certain services that are available to fintechs that I think are worth mentioning, like, for example, the Ontario Securities Commission's Launchpad, which is essentially a regulatory sandbox for fintechs that are setting up in Canada that allows them to more easily navigate the regulatory landscape. Um, similar programs exist in the FCA in the UK and, and also in Australia. So um, there are programs that are available to, to fintechs to help them navigate that um, landscape. So that concludes the presentation. Um, I really appreciate your time today. After hearing uh, Swoop's story, we will now move on to David McCarthy at SOTI and hear about their journey and experiences. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to listen in today. I want to talk about SOTI and in particular our growth here in Ireland and our plans going forward. For those that don't know, SOTI is an innovative technology company. We build solutions that reduce the cost and complexity of your business critical mobility and IoT uh, fleet. Thousands of companies around the world depend on us to secure, manage and support their mobile operations today. Over two decades, we've built strong alliances with leading mobile platforms and device manufacturers with a commitment to research and development right here in Galway. It's made us the market leader um, we're delivering fresh and exciting solutions. Overall, Saudi helps businesses take mobility to endless possibilities. A um, little bit about me. My name is David McCarthy, and over the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I'd like to talk a little bit about Saudi. Here's a little bit about me first. I'm responsible for our sales and operations here in Ireland. My main aim is to grow and nurture our channel partnerships and alliances here in the region as demand for Saudi has accelerated. Ireland forms an integral part of our long-term growth strategy here uh, as, we are, as we're expanding our European footprint. My journey with technology began around 14 years ago when I began working in the telecom industry, moving into ICT, IoT and SaaS roles. I'm passionate about technology and in particular the areas of mobility, security and collaboration. Now, from a business perspective, Saudi has been around since 1995. We've over 17,000 enterprise customers managing millions and millions of devices and are growing at a phenomenal rate of 30% year on year. We've been doing this for at least the last five years. Most companies might be happy with a 2% to 5% growth rate, if lucky. So you can see that Saudi are doing quite well at the moment. Now, being a Canadian company, the majority of our revenue comes from exporting our software all around the world to different countries. We do this with the help of our 4,000 partners, channel partners all around the world. So we have a total employee count of 1,400 all around the world. We support all operating systems from Windows, iOS, Android to Linux, 
and we offer a range of support tiers from premium to enterprise, where our 24-7, 365 support is integral to supporting our partners and our end users. OK, let's take a, a look at some of our 17,000 enterprise customers we work with today. In the top left, you can see straight away there's many car manufacturers, BMW, Volkswagen, Audi, Hyundai, Toyota, and there's many, many others. American Airlines obviously are huge in the aviation side, but we also work with other airlines such as Airbus, Ryanair, uh, Alitalia, and Delta. And when it comes to food, Saudi support supports some of the bigger players in this market too. McDonald's, Burger King, you can see Pepsi and Coke as well. Uh, there's also many retail stores, Best Buy, Staples, Michaels, and many other big brands uh, right across, right around the world. We also do really well in the food delivery space. We large customers like Just Eat, Skip the Dishes, and Deliveroo. So what you see is our customers coming from a variety of different verticals, T&L, Transport and Logistics, Manufacturing, Retail, Field Services, uh, and Healthcare as well. They're all using mobile devices in mission critical operations. So leveraging Saudi's tools um, helps them manage, manage it all. Saudi strives to be the best in what we do. And it's important to be recognized in the industry that you're in. Our very own CEO, Carl, Carl Rodriguez, won the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2018. PC Magazine rated Saudi as the best MDM solution four years in a row. They actually try out our software. They listen to demonstrations of the products. They play around with our product. They even call our support team so they can really get into the thick of things. And that's why we love getting this award. Not only that, but Deloitte has recognized Saudi as one of the fastest growing tech companies in North America, and we've won this award three years in a row. That's a cool award because when you look at the tech companies compared, compared to in this, all different types of tech companies, green tech, biotech, fintech. So to be rated as one of the fastest growing is an achievement. And we've also won several other awards for our IoT solutions as well. So lots to talk about. Saudi has global offices all around the world. In Canada, we have four offices alone, including our HQ, which is near the airport. And we've also got a research and innovation lab in Waterloo. Our EMEA headquarters is in the UK. We've also just recently opened up an office in Japan. We have two big offices in India, one in Southern India in Kochi and one in, in New Delhi. We have sales offices in Dubai, Australia. And we also have an office in Sweden, which we've just opened. We also have a research and development office right here in Galway, Ireland. Saudi Ireland was established in 2017. We did this in late December and one sole director was required for setup. Carl, our CEO, visited Ireland and worked with the IDA, which is the Irish Development Authority. Consider, he considered many locations. Galway on the west of Ireland was chosen. We were in a shared office space originally, however, in mid-2019, we made the move to the heart of Galway, which is still our home today. We, eng we engaged with local media and news agencies when we arrived. Our first employee was hired in summer 2018. Bank accounts, payroll and pensions were all set up with the appropriate businesses, and this was very, very easy to do so. Some pros and cons on setting up. Let's start with the pros. Ireland as a, as a location has a real attraction for quality of life. EU citizens have full freedom and movement for work. We've hired and relocated from five different EU countries and nine non-EU countries with a 95% success rate in relocation and retention. We have a strong talent pool here in Ireland. It's an extremely strong workforce to choose from with three quarters of our IT specialists having third level qualifications or above that. Over half of our 25 year old to 50 year olds have hold third level qualifications or above. Hiring in interns now convert into full-time team and members. We hire that directly from the universities. Tech support, our tech support team is hiring grads as a main source with the plan to onboarding them at, as, as full-time employees. The IDA, the Irish Development Authority, they're responsible for foreign direct investment here into Ireland, and they've been so easy to work with. They introduced Carl, our CEO, to other organizations who went on similar journeys and they helped right along the way. They were very helpful in the whole setup with advice and giving guidance. Guidance. Some have even said it's easier to set up a company in Ireland than it is in Canada. 
there's many grants located if you're going to choose outside of the capital, outside of Dublin. And our EU customers also love being billed in euros and paying for services within the EU. Some of the cons. Employment permit processing by the DETE. So the DETE is our Department of Enterprise for Trade and Employment. Applications significantly increased. There was a huge increase in demand. So the time scale here has been improved of late. And at the start, managing the EU to the non-EU balance was tough as, as we had small numbers and as we grew. So filling technical roles with a native European language skills have also been a challenge for us here in, in Saudi. Some of the lessons learned. Setting up a trusted partner to facilitate employment permit fast tracking. This would have half time, half some of our time in, in some cases. This would have been a huge benefit. Contracting out payrolls, pensions and health care outsourced to one organization that can handle a whole lot together rather than separate separate uh, organizations. Our senior team recruitment was slow. Now, this took a lot longer than expected and therefore impacted our growth numbers by about a year and a half, 18 months. Tech team will be under, underneath six months after that, but we would, hire broad, we would hire a broader senior team from the start at the outset if we had to plan it again. So why Ireland and why Galway? Our fantastic office in Cathedral Square, Galway City Centre. It's home to our employees with many more roles advertised right now to join us in some key positions, including sales, technical support and software development. As I said earlier, Ireland forms an integral part of our long term growth strategy as we expand our European footprint. So what we learned as we grew, scaling the business. Initially, we thought of only de developers, followed by technical support after. As we grew, we definitely see the, saw the need in leaders and key functions from, from the offset. Now, we're growing alongside these areas as part of the strategy, from sales, support to professional services and much more. So what does the future look like? The future looks like for, for us at Saudi in Ireland, partner growth first and foremost, growing our business here in Ireland and Europe with strong partner growth through the channel team. Collaborations with global strategic partners such as Honeywell, Datalogic, Panasonic, Brother and Zebra. Our team is locally structured here to support these partners on tech issues in the field and with customers. With increased footprint, we can have more direct conversations with people to grow out our business. Scaling for growth. So now that we've hired our senior team, the focus is on growing the next pool of, of talent, the next generation of talent. Working alongside the colleges and the universities for graduates, putting them into roles is a big advantage for us. With this educated workforce, we hire directly from the college and university and quickly scaling up these people to become future leaders or future shining stars. Thank you for listening in. I appreciate your time. Any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks again. Thank you, David. As with everything we do, there is a human side to our stories. The Irish Canadian Immigration Centre offers outreach and information in areas of employment, social services and immigration. So check out their website for further details and see how they can help you. And that concludes the lineup for the first Ireland Canada Business Council networking event brought to you on behalf of our member chambers in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Ottawa, and the Ireland Alberta Trade Association. Sincere thank you to our honorable guests, His Excellency Dr. Eamon McKee, Her Excellency Nancy Smythe, and the team here in Ireland and Canada. If you have any questions for specific speakers, please contact us at info at ICCCOTT. Gurmila Mahagath, merci. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, be well. Mm -hmm.